The Spirit of God is with you. And also with you. My name is Lori Warfield, and I serve this congregation as the Elder for Life and Chair of Stewardship. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Truly, it is good and it is joyful to be with you as we worship God from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Some quick reminders before worship begins. Please turn off your, or silence your cell phones. We are recording the worship service and it will premiere on YouTube tonight at 6 p.m. Please hold any applause until the end of worship. Leading us in worship today are Sol Rosado, guest organist, Debbie Walker, Director of Advocacy and Christian Education, Nancy Walker, Vice Chair of the Elders and Co-Chair Church Life and Growth, Chad Vickers, Co-Chair Outreach, Reverend Ron Dauphin, Chair of the Board, and Reverend Nathan Russell, Senior Pastor. When we come to our time of prayer, we will mention only the first names of those who are on our prayer list. If you would like to add to our prayer list, there are yellow slips of paper in the pew, in the pew racks, and at the conclusion of worship, you can place the yellow slips in the offering box near the stairway at the back of the narthex. During the offertory, you may complete a giving envelope, and as with prayer requests, place your giving envelopes in the secure box in the narthex. Throughout the offering meditation, I encourage you to reflect on God's manifold gifts and myriad blessings. When we come to the table, the diaconate will come forward on the last verse of the communion hymn. At the beginning of the communion meditation, please come forward by the side aisles and return to your seat by the center aisle. If someone in your row is differently abled, please take a pop-top communion to share with them. On the back cover of the worship guide is a QR code. You can scan this code with a smartphone or other device and open our website where you can do register attendance, submit a prayer request, or give online, or all of those. Our upcoming events for this week are listed on the back of the worship guide, and as always, our social media accounts are active, so I encourage you to interact with us in multiple ways at WACCElyria.org. Beloved of God, this is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. We are the body of Christ. We are diverse in gender, sexuality, race, and ability. And in Christ, we find wondrous affirmation that inspires us to strive for the future God wants and ultimately will have. Our worship of God is about to begin. So, dear friends, I say to you, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord.
vision, despite a challenging week beset by sickness and Supreme Court decisions that further disenfranchise and minoritize people, we trust that you are nevertheless at work. We are here with the faith that 
through your Spirit's inspiration, we may ponder anew all that you will do. Help us dream challenging dreams of both depth and precision. Though the month of pride just ended, we sense that you are nevertheless breaking the sun's rays into color, a rainbow around us. Still yet arched in the sky, beauty and promise are nigh. You give us hope that astounds us. Throughout this hour of worship, open our hearts and minds to your continuing revelation so that we may be a church of affirming action from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Amen. Pray together. God, who lives in our hearts, here we are again. This sacred time of coming together as your people of faith helps us to stay strong in an unjust and often cruel world. Give us the courage to say something when we hear or see an injustice, even when with family, friends, and neighbors. Keep that familiar phrase in our hearts. What would Jesus do? God of human transformation, for your presence now we pray. Thank you for this beautiful blue planet that is our home. Help us to live purposefully and mindfully as we each do our small part to keep it safe for future generations. God of human transformation, for your presence, now we pray. We know many folks who need your help, God. We pray for the health and wholeness of all. And today, we ask for strength and healing for those in our hearts that we now remember silently or aloud. We also hold these persons deep within our hearts. 
as we speak their names aloud to you. Annika, Barb and Rodney, Brian, Carson, Cheryl, Diane and Dennis, Gail, Hamilton, Isabel, John, John, Amanda, and Ava, Keith Worcester, Leslie, Linda, Lindsay, Mary, Megan and Kevin, Monique and Waverly, Nathan, Rosalie and Jim, Sharon, Shirley, Vivian, and Wes. We pray for the loved ones of those who have made their transition to the he their heavenly homes. God of all, wrap your loving arms around and comfort the family and friends of Warren and of Sherry. And now, let us join together and pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. for today, I've spent much time reflecting on stewardship and what I understand that to mean both individually and collectively. With this, I repeatedly come back to a charge I read by Jaya John. If you aren't familiar with Jaya, he is an indigenous person born into foster care in New Mexico who has made freedom his life's work and rehumanizing his mission. I share with you this quote from Jaya. Don't arrive at gatherings like a dead thing on automatic. Arrive like fire. Be all the way present, alive, ready to burn away what needs to be shed to prepare the ground for new seed. Arrive in full-throated song. Arrive dancing and drumming. Arrive as all your people. You aren't at the gathering for you. You are there for all of us. Ancestors should swirl around you. Ceremony ought to drip from your skin. Water teachings flooding from your eyes. All your love should be at high tide. You should be a tidal wave or a gentle sand soaking up truth or a coral reef protecting your people and all living things. When you join a gathering, pry yourself open and pour out medicine. Your whole life has been a pestle and mortar, grinding moments to paste and powder. Don't be stingy. Make your offering. May we hear in Jaya's words a renewed call to active stewardship. And may we use our times and our talents and our monies wildly, like fire and dance, to sustain the gatherings. May we pray with one another. God, we offer our gifts as stewards of the mission and ministry of Washington Avenue Christian Church so that our church can take affirming action in a world that discriminates against women, people of color, those who are differently abled, and LGBTQIA plus folks. Help us to use our gifts so that we might all gather in love and humility, in full-throated song, in service to your people. We give you these varied offerings so that we can work in love as you directed. 
forever. Amen. From the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 15, verses 29 through 39. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. After Jesus left Tyre and Sidon, he went by the Sea of Galilee, and he went up the mountain, sitting down there. Great crowds came to him, bringing with them disabled, blind, and mute people, 
and people missing body parts along with many others. Then they put them at his feet and he healed them so that the crowd was amazed when they saw mute people speaking, people missing body parts made whole, disabled people walking, and blind people seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for the crowd because they have stayed with me for three days now and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry for they might collapse on the road. The disciples said to him, where are we to get so much bread in the desert as to feed so great a crowd? Jesus asked them, well, how many loaves have you? They said, seven and a few small fish. Then ordering the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds and all of them ate and were filled and they took up the abundance of fragments Seven baskets full. Those who ate were women and children, besides 4,000 men. (laughs) Then sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. For the word of God in its promise and covenant, thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Calm, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you empower us to take affirming action, then nothing else matters. And if you do not empower us to take affirming action, then nothing else matters. Inspire us now with promise and possibility. We make this prayer in the name of the one who has given us the voice to speak and the words to say, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Oh, church, it is good to see you. Last weekend, I was in the city of New York for the 50th anniversary of Celebrate Life, the best-selling Christian musical of all time from whence the beloved communion hymn in in remembrance of me comes. I returned at Odark 30 early Monday morning and hours later tested positive for the COVID-19. Not the souvenir I wanted to bring home from the Big Apple. This week has been rough and the jury was out for quite some time on whether I would actually be here today, let alone preach, or not. So, put another way, I wasn't sure if I was going to be seen or viewed. Uh, There is a difference, and that difference matters. While laid in bed in exile, uh, in one of the second floor guest rooms of our home, Um, I had ample opportunity and time to think about today's biblical text. There are healings, which, you know, sounded pretty good to me at the time, in addition to one of the feeding stories, except this one is the feeding of the 4,000, not 5,000. All four Gospels have the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 women, children, and some men. But only Matthew and Mark recall Jesus feeding the slightly smaller crowd. So for the record, the feeding of the 5,000 occurs in the previous chapter of Matthew, and it seems a little soon for the evangelist to be repeating a sermon, uh, and yet there's nuance to this differing story. Details not given in the 
previous feeding story pique our curiosity and sense of wonder at this Jesus who takes affirming action. Just before today's text, and if you were here last week for Glennis' sermon, you'll remember a woman who is Canaanite has just encountered Jesus. She catches him when he's got his compassion down. I think Jesus views her before he sees her. There is a difference, and that difference matters. She bests him in a theological argument that causes Jesus to change his mind. Finally, she is both seen and heard. Jesus takes affirming action and says, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. Now, Jesus departs the region of Tyre and Sidon, goes up the mountain, sits down there, and we think we're about to get another repeated sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, but no. Even though it begins in the same way, no. This time, great crowds came to Jesus, bringing with them disabled, blind, and mute people, and people missing body parts, along with many others. Clearly, the word about this Jesus has gotten out. Perhaps the woman of Canaanite descent has become one of the greatest early evangelists in the Jesus movement in the span of just two verses. Jesus has discovered just how far the compassion of God can reach, and now it's time to put such healing compassion into affirming action for all. And yet, here, for me, is right where the trouble starts. You may think I have lost my marbles or that the COVID-19 has done something to my sanctified imagination. For what could be more troubling about Jesus healing those who were brought to him? Mute people speaking, people missing body parts made whole, disabled people walking, blind people seeing. We should be joining the crowd, rank and file, and praise the God of Israel just as they did, right? Maybe. That depends if we are viewing or seeing. There is a difference, and the difference matters. Whenever I get curious about a biblical text, I look for where the action is. Specifically, I go for the verbs. I highlight the English ones, and then I go to the Greek to see what's really going on before the translators, who I'm convinced were all able-bodied people, cleaned, they cleaned it up and packaged, it up and packaged the text up with a bow so that our assumptions about those who are differently abled, the crowds, and Jesus are left unchallenged and safely intact. Without curiosity about this text, we assume that the crowd brought with them the disabled and the crowds put the disabled at Jesus' feet. We think that is affirming action, but that did not happen. It's not even close to what happened. For the Greek says that the crowd flung the disabled at Jesus' feet. This verb in no way discloses gently laying people down. They were tossed, hurled, as if they were trash. In fact, the only other time this exact verb is used in Scripture describes throwing a tackle overboard a boat. The people who are differently abled are not welcome or wanted by the crowds, And the crowds don't know what to do with those who have differing abilities. So the crowds hurl them toward Jesus as if they are the rejects of society. Side note, the King James of all translations actually gets it right. 
It says, the crowds cast out. We should consider that there are scriptures on which the crowd could hang their hats. Consider this. No one of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the food of his God. Indeed, no one who has a blemish shall draw near. No one who is blind or lame or one who is mutilated or deformed or one who has a broken foot or a broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a man with a defect in his eye or an itching disease or scabs or <clears throat> crushed testicles. With Scripture casting persons with disabilities as despised, rejected by God, shamed or cursed, is it, is it any wonder that others, especially crowds, avoided contact with the differently abled? Is it any surprise that such scripture and biases created a culture in which people with differing abilities are socially stigmatized and marginalized? Lest we think that was 2,000 years ago and we're much more enlightened, a 2018 Scope research study revealed the following. 67% of people feel uncomfortable talking to a disabled person. People who are differently abled make up about 25% of the U.S. population and 15% of the global population. Yet simply by existing, this minoritized population still makes the majority of able-bodied people uncomfortable. Anybody who does not fit in a tidy box of cured or normal makes other people feel out of place. This biblical text and our enduring assumptions perpetuate the ideology of ableism. We who are able-bodied are the ideal. Those who are not fully able-bodied need to be fixed, cured, flung at the feet of Jesus. He'll take care of you. Well, what does that say about God, Jesus, and the people who are differently abled? Amy Kinney writes in her book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request, to assume that my disability needs to be erased in order for me to live an abundant life is disturbing, not only because of what it says about me, but also because of what it reveals about people's notions of God. I bear the image of the Alpha and the Omega. My disabled body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I have the mind of Christ. There's no caveat on these promises. I do not have a junior Holy Spirit because I am disabled. To suggest that I am anything less than sanctified and redeemed is to suppress the image of God in my disabled body and to limit how God is already at work through my life. Maybe we need to be freed, not from disability, but from the notion that it limits my ability to showcase God's radiance to the church. What we need to be freed from is ableism. I think what she is saying is that she longs to be seen rather than viewed. There is a difference, and that difference matters. On the front cover of today's worship guide is a beautiful painting, which most of us viewed. In fact, my parents purchased a print of this artwork shortly after I was born. I can still recall the different places this lithograph hung. 
But did you see who painted it? Did you see the artwork attribution on the back cover? Johnny Erickson Tata is the artist's name. She lives with quadriplegia, paralysis of all four limbs. Joni created this beautiful artwork with a paintbrush held between her teeth and lips. Or how about the hymn of prayer and the sung prayer response? We viewed the music on the page. We sang, we heard. But did our eyes scan down to the bottom of the hymnal to see the credit of both the lyricist and the composer? Ken Miedema, who composed and wrote the lyrics to From Our Doorsteps to Earth's Corners, a person who lives without physical sight. We viewed both the artwork and the hymn but did we see the artist who created them? To be seen or viewed, there is a difference, and the difference matters. We live in a world that privileges viewing over seeing. We want another modern day example. All we have to look to do is look. <coughs> at the phenomenon of being colorblind, the white mythology, if there ever was one. There was a time in my life where I thought colorblind was virtuous, altruistic. That was my assumption until a friend and colleague got a hold of me and said, until you can see me, all of me, you don't even know me. I'm not here for you. Her rebuke stung, and initially I wanted to get defensive, and some of my white friends tried to encourage me, but what I realized my friend pointed out to me was that I had not seen her, nor had I taken into account the sheer onslaught of oppression that she faces every morning of the world. I wanted to fix racism, but I didn't understand that I, in my own arrogance, hubris, privilege, was a participant in perpetuating the problem. Though this may be a bit harsh, I wonder if I was trying to hurl my friend at the feet of Jesus. On second thought, I don't think this sounds a bit harsh at all because I know firsthand what it is like, maybe not for a crowd, but for one's parents to hurl one to therapy, make that reparative therapy. In 2009, shortly after coming out, my parents begged, urged me to go to Living Hope Ministries at the First Baptist Church of Arlington, Texas. Now, hurling may be a bit of a stretch. It was for my parents and my father in particular who accompanied me. They dropped me at this church where we did not, I repeat, did not meet Jesus. They wanted to fix me. Though this is somewhat a, a cleaned up version of what I said to the minister at First Baptist Church Arlington, I finally said, I am not broken. I am whole. I am a gay that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. What God has called clean, let no one call unclean. Maybe that's what I wish I would have said. You know, hindsight's 2020. This past week, Thursday and Friday especially, it's demoralizing for many people of color and LGBTQIA plus persons. On Thursday, the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action. I imagine that most of us 
have opinions on affirmative action, but few of us have ever worked in collegiate admissions to understand what it is and its intention. In short, the question is, what role does race play in college admissions? And in practice, affirmative action meant the following. When faced with two candidates who look similar on paper, a college or university should make an affirming action and matriculate the minoritized student. Yes, there is more nuance, but that's the gist. By striking down affirmative action, the 6-3 Supreme Court essentially said, we're colorblind. The Honorable Katanji Brown Jackson wrote in her dissent, deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. Affirming action requires that we, the people, see racial disparities and racial hardships that are not intrinsic to the DNA of people of color, but are part of the red, white, and blue fabric of these yet-to-be United States. On Friday the last day of Pride Month, the same 6-3 majority again made it now legal to to discriminate against LGBTQIA plus people, which, by the way, is a protected class under federal law. What made this case troubling was that the web designer an evangelical Christian from Colorado said that a gay person had contacted her about designing a wedding website. She refused to do it and cited her Christian belief. That's her story, and she's sticking to it. Only it didn't happen. The person named Stuart, who allegedly contacted the web developer, was located by the media and asked about this issue. To which he answered, I am incredibly surprised given the fact that I have been happily married to a woman for the last 15 years. So we LGBTQIA plus people now have less rights. We do not have equal protection under the law. We're hurting, grieving, mad, and we need that to be seen not just viewed. However, if you fling us or cast us out at the feet of Jesus, well, we might just talk to Jesus about you. Speaking of those who are differently abled and are cast down, flung at Jesus' feet, something wondrous does happen to them, with them, for them. They are healed. But that's another one of those verbs that's more complex than we know. In Greek, the verb is hey therapeusin. So if you heard the word therapy in the middle of that, well, then you're on to something. While, while healed is a good translation, it is not the only possibility. Jesus attended them. Jesus waited upon them. Jesus adored them. Jesus relieved them. All of these are possibilities within that one verb. It's as if Jesus asked them, tell me what's wrong. How can I help? I really want to see you. Jesus does everything that the crowds didn't. He takes affirming action. In her book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request, Amy Kinney writes, Jesus' ministry is not all about a physical cure, 
but about holistic healing. Curing is a physical process. It's individual, usually fairly rapid, and concentrates on eliminating disease. Side note, for example, I took Paxlovid this week, and it has helped cure me from the COVID-19. But the goal of healing is not fixing, but restoring. Healing is a lengthy and ongoing sociocultural and transformative process that seeks to make someone whole. It focuses on restoring interpersonal, social, and spiritual dimensions, even when physical and differing abilities remain. I cannot tell you for sure if the people who are differently abled, blind, mute, and people missing body parts, along with many others, suddenly had 20-20 vision, perfect speech, or, I don't know, grew their missing body parts? That's just kind of weird. But, I mean, quite frankly, I doubt that happened. But I will stake my very life on this claim. Jesus took affirming action. He attended them. He made them whole, complete. Then something unique happens. The crowd, the ones who flung the differently abled people at Jesus' feet, they were amazed when they (laughs) saw mute people speaking, people missing body parts made whole, disabled people walking, and blind people seeing. Perhaps the hidden healing in this story is that the crowd no longer views but sees. There is a difference, and that difference matters. And having seen, they are liberated to take affirming action in the future. When I was in New York, I met many friends within the singing group Invariably, they would ask, what do you do? I'm a pastor, I'd answer. Where? I'd tell them. How long have you been there? Almost five years, I'd say. And what do you think? Well, my answer was that I grow more smitten with Washington Avenue Christian Church by the day. Huh, some people would say. We don't hear that often from pastors, and I'd respond, well, you ought to see this church. Five years ago yesterday, this church took a vote, and you called me as your pastor. Five years, friends, five. You took affirming action. You saw me, and for better or for worse, you said, yeah, you look like a pastor to us. Let's do ministry together. Why not? And so we have. And I cannot think of a single more affirming event in all my life than that one. What a gift in every way. And though the task of the last five years has been oh so challenging, and we questioned if we had or would be enough, Jesus seemed to ask us, what have you got to work with? We showed him. He said, that's enough. I can work wonders with that. And since then, we have discerned together the church that God is calling us to be and become. With the Spirit's Spirit's help, we have transformed, metamorphosized like the monarch butterfly. We have become more diverse and not just more inclusive, but more expansive in ways I could have only dreamed five years ago. Because of your affirming action, The whole wide world is seeing 
A church in which people of differing age, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ability, you name it, are leading. A church in which all people are welcome and wanted for who they are and that this church is not trying to fix them. Such affirming action creates a recklessly inclusive invitation to praise the God of all time and space. Or, put another way, differently abled, differently labeled, wide in the circle round Jesus Christ. Crutches and stigmas, cultures, enigmas, all come together round Jesus Christ. Love will relate us, color or status, can't segregate us round Jesus Christ. Family and failings, human derailings, all are accepted round Jesus Christ. Bound by one vision, met for one mission, we claim each other round Jesus Christ. Here is my mother, here is my brother, kindred and spirit through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
We gather around Christ's open table today as people invited, welcomed, and wanted. As Jesus gathered his first disciples, they were people like us. They didn't have all the answers. They were confused at times about things of faith. They were common people and no two were alike. Some were fishers and farmers. One was a tax collector. Some were activists. Some were outspoken. Others were not. Some were bold. Others more reserved. It all had a place at the table. We too gather with differences that make each person unique. And today we celebrate our inclusion in the gifts God offers that we may be made whole. With open hearts and minds, let us join with our elder in prayer. Thank you, God, for bringing us all here at this table. All are invited, all are wanted. May this bread and cup always help us remember that that is so. Amen. We remember on the night when Jesus and the disciples had their last meal together. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat and as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant given for you and for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. With joy and thankfulness, we share in the gifts of God. Come, for all things are ready.
Five years ago, I did not know what I was getting myself into. Uh, <clears throat> and neither did y'all, but we've, we've, we've made it work. And I would not trade it for the world. I think when joining this church, too, we don't know what we are getting ourselves into. But oh my, what a journey it is with the Spirit of God and one another. If you would like to become part of this church in a formal way, I invite you to come forward as we stand together and sing our hymn of discipleship. It is in your chalice hymnal. We're singing a different tune to it, which is why it is notated on the back of your worship guide. But let us stand and sing together.
Beloved of God, our worship is nearing its conclusion, but our participation in the mission of God, it never, ever ends. So, come on, let's go from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth to make a plain declaration and a public demonstration of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ. May we remember that we are never, ever very far from God's heart. And finally, finally, may we trust with all that we have and all that we are that the future God wants and ultimately will have is here and now, even as it is still on its way.